Good morning, I'm Jason Corey and welcome to another episode of Talking Tech, where we cut through the fluff and tell you just what you need to know about emerging technology in the government. Uh, today I'm joined by Matt Zager and Trevor Quinn. The topic of today's discussion is going to be about containers. There's been a bunch of news recently released about container technology. Specifically today we're going to talk about how you can containerize legacy applications. And before we jump into the content, I want to give my guests a chance to introduce themselves. Matt? Yeah, Matt Zager. I lead the uh, Solution Architect team for our Department of Defense uh, organization. Uh, I come from a 15 years background at a system integrator where I was a developer, system engineer, and system architect. Trevor Quinn, I'm the PaaS and DevOps practice lead for Red Hat Consulting North America, and I lead a specialist team of consultants and architects who are responsible for OpenShift and container platform implementations across the United States. Uh, we focus on kind of harvesting best practices and patterns from some of our large implementations, taking those back, consolidating them, and, and making sure we, we take those out for, uh, for the rest of our consult, uh, customer base to kind of take advantage of. Great, and just a reminder for the audience, so the Talking Tech series was developed uh, to take questions that we get asked in the field by multiple customers over and over again, and video record them to help answer questions for you at home. Uh, so we're going to cut through the fluff, as I mentioned, and get right into it. So just before we get into discussions about how you can take legacy applications and containerize them, uh, for the audience, can, Matt, can you talk about just what the definition of containers are and uh, kind of give us some foundational education there? Sure. Uh, you know, one of the misconceptions is that containers is new. Uh, this is not new technology. It's actually been around a while. Um, this is core technology that's built into the Linux operating system that gives us the ability to run multi-tenant applications securely sharing an operating system instance, uh, primarily composed of three main things. Uh, first is the packaging standard, making it portable uh, across environments. Secondly, it's an API to be able to run those containers on the OS. And then it's technologies built into the operating system itself Things like kernel namespaces, control groups, uh, SE Linux mandatory access controls uh, that allow us to run these applications side by side securely. Okay, so just so I understand, so it's predominantly a image format on how to package an application and then a way to run it on a variety of different types of infrastructures where there's Linux involved? Correct. Okay, and then Trevor, I know you mentioned you were in the consulting group, so can you talk about some of the main reasons uh, clients across government are adopting container technology? Well, there are a lot of drivers for it. So portability is, is one of the major reasons, just being able to take the same application and run it in a different platform, uh, whether that's a cloud, a public cloud implementation, private cloud implementation. Uh, there is the notion of standardization, having some consistency about the definition of the application and the operating environment for that application, um, having that neatly packaged uh, in, in such a way that you can sort of um, capture that same consistency regardless of the deployment environment. Um, it's, it's a uh, technology that really lends itself toward DevOps and, and deployment automation, so being able to rapidly push out feature changes and, and move them through different stages from dev to test to production. Um, those are some of the, the okay. major drivers at this point. Yeah. So if I'm a agency CIO, I guess the first question is, is like, what is a container, which you guys have answered for me. The second one is, what are some of the reasons? So it sounds like uh, app portability is a big reason. And then also, I've read a lot about the ability to run more applications on a hardware stack. So it right. gets into, into some of the density pieces there. So if, if again, if I'm a CIO and I have let's say 40 or 50 applications, how would I go about assessing which one of those applications could even run in this Linux container technology? Matt, what, what would you advise? Yeah, I would say, you know, for most uh, CIOs, you have to look at your application inventory, looking where you're going to get the most uh, bang for your buck when you come to prioritization of which ones you'll choose. But, uh, you know, from a technology perspective, there are certain applications that lend themselves to make this a lot easier. Uh, you know, web applications, things that were developed with primarily a web-based interface, um, accessible over those types of protocols. Uh, even enterprise applications, things that may have been deployed inside of JBoss application servers or WebLogic servers, uh, things that were meant to be deployed that way. Um, I think those are the, the primary uh, things that you look at initially to get quick wins for that deployment in the container so that you can then look deeper in your portfolio for other opportunities. Got it. So the predominant ones would be web 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 applications, uh, potentially Java applications running on a full blown Java EE server, and then is it typically just applications that run on Linux today that are good containers, or can I, if I have a lot of applications running on something like Windows, do those, can those potentially be run in containers as well? 
Uh, today, it's primarily going to be Linux technologies that are going to be the candidates. Um, we have seen uh, some advertising by Microsoft that says the container technologies are moving into the Windows space, but today, it's primarily Linux-based applications that'll be your target. So Trevor, one of the things I was, that I always get asked by clients is, you know, what the history, where, where do containers come from? So I know a lot of people talk about them coming from, you know, some of the open source communities with the Linux kernel, uh, but can you talk about the history of containers and then some of the large-scale deployments that might have uh, kind of been the foundation for uh, the technology? Sure. So <clears throat> one of the uh, the trailblazers, I guess, for um, large-scale container implementations was was Google. Um, they they certainly kind of through their adoption of um, of containers and container orchestration. Um, really kind of led the way, but we're starting to see mass adoption uh, of containers across the board in various industries, whether it's retail, healthcare, uh, financial services, and, and federal agencies as well. Pretty much any organization that's interested in, in trying to find a way to standardize and uh, capture as, as a portable artifact both the application source code and the environment in which it runs. Um, those are those are going to be good good candidates for uh, for uptake of the technology. Okay, so if I'm an agency CIO now, I know what containers are. Uh, I've got a good idea of what some of the benefits could be for my particular agency. Of my existing legacy application portfolio, I've got some good candidates that could be good targets to run containers in. So Matt, can you talk about if I'm at that point now where I've containerized some of my legacy apps, and now I need to push them and feel them into production. What are some of the other types of technologies that go along with containers uh, outside of the, you know, the format and the, the runtime? Great question. So, you know, the application framework itself uh, is very interesting to be able to containerize an application, but once you start deploying in the enterprise, you need to be able to run these applications at scale. You need to be able to manage them. So when you talk about management and orchestration, we're talking about open source projects like Kubernetes. The ability to deploy and manage applications at scale, again, coming out of Google, technology that allows you to be able to do that. Things that make it important to be able to run, you know, in a hybrid cloud environment, on premise, across different cloud providers, being able to scale applications, uh, being able to manage the high availability of those applications with low touch requirements on your operations staff. So I would say that management and orchestration is the next big piece you need after containerizing. Okay. That's right. Trevor, any other thoughts? Yeah, I mean I think we've gotten to the stage where organizations have some Docker or container footprint uh, somewhere, whether it's just at the individual developer level, um, and it's it's kind of proven out as a as a kind of building block technology. But now organizations are starting to look at well, how do we how do we take this same uh, technology out to production? How do we start to build larger and larger implement implementations, getting past you know a single server? into larger multi-tiered applications, the components of which are all containerized. How do you manage that with the same SLAs, operational expectations, that you're already kind of, uh, you've already set the bar for in a traditional virtualized environment? And that's really where uh, a container platform starts coming into play uh, and container orchestration through Kubernetes and, and similar, uh, similar technologies. Okay, so we've heard about uh, Docker being the container runtime and format, right? We've heard about Kubernetes from an orchestration standpoint. Uh, so what's Red Hat's role in these open source communities like Docker and Kubernetes? Uh, maybe both of you could touch on that, but Matt, if you want to start. Sure, so uh, like a lot of what we do here at Red Hat is participate in what are called upstream open source projects. Um, we become committers on those programs, so like um, the Docker community, we are a major contributor to that. Kubernetes, we're a major contributor to that. And then what we do is we take it through uh, an integration process whereby we'll make open source platforms like OpenShift Origin, where it's an integration of a lot of these technologies. And then finally, we bring it through a productization process where we harden it, apply security certifications to it, certify it on hardware, uh, and then support it for a long term uh, as a product uh, through a Red Hat subscription. Yeah, I think it's important to realize that uh, the open source projects uh, represent kind of um, interesting technology for uh, organizations that have a lot of internal um, engineering capability and, and expertise and a willingness to kind of um, tinker with, uh, with the internals of, of the project to, to get uh, that technology working for their organization. What Red Hat provides is kind of a view into that project to look at what does it take to take that open source project to an enterprise setting 
um, such that a wide pool of, of you know, Fortune 500 technologies who aren't necessarily focused on kind of the nuts and bolts and internals of, of those technologies, how do they operationalize it? How do they get it working for them um, in, in such a way that they don't have to have you know, large teams of engineers just focusing on the, on the frameworks and tools themselves. Rather, they can focus on their business uh, and the technology that, that supports it. So I think that's kind of what Red Hat brings to the table, looking at some of these open source upstreams and figuring out what needs to be added or adjusted, uh, what needs to be tested and validated to make it an enterprise-ready tool as opposed to just kind of a, a cool and interesting uh, technology. Got it, and with, uh, so with that OpenShift container platform, you get an enterprise Linux distro, which we established uh, being a major component of it, supported Kubernetes, uh, which is the technology originally built by Google that Red Hat's the number two contributor to, mm -hmm. uh, and then the Docker project. Uh, and all that's rolled into OpenShift? Absolutely. And what, what, other, what other technologies are uh, critical that are in OpenShift? Is it just those three, or are there other things that OpenShift's delivering as a uh, value add? Uh, there's, so there's a lot of uh, interesting pieces in there, including what we call the, the runtimes that are available through uh, Red Hat software collections. So those will be supported versions of programming languages like Node.js, Ruby, Perl, PHP, databases like MySQL, Postgres, Mongo, uh, and our JBoss middleware. So enterprise application platforms, Fuse, uh, integration platforms, data virtualization, et cetera. So there's a lot of certified runtimes that also come inside of OpenShift as well. Matt, Trevor, thanks so much for your time. That's going to be uh, it for a wrap of Talking Tech. Uh, to audience members, thanks so much for joining us for these short educational sessions. Uh, you can email us anytime at talkingtech at redhat.com. Otherwise, we'll see you on our next episode. Thanks very much.